What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Okay? I am. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right, everybody, in Liberty and Health, episode number 106, I think. I think, I think, I think, I think. I've been looking forward to making this happen for quite a while. I had this gentleman on on my first censored YouTube video back uh, probably about six months ago or so. And uh, I'm very honored to have him back on the show today. Uh, Mr. Eric Jackman, how you doing, man? Kyle, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on again. And geez, where did six months go? Yeah. It, when you live in clown world, it goes by pretty fucking quick. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even keep track of the, the new thing, you know, it's, I just, we have to watch the MSN Mockingbird Media to tell us the directions for what flag to hang outside of our house. I mean, apparently now Liz Cheney's a hero, so I tweeted that I want to hang the Halliburton flag um, out front because of her courageous actions with the J6 committee and um, <laughs> take down my rainbow Ukraine flag um, because I wanted to send money to Zelensky for his gender reassignment surgery mm -hmm. and, um, put up the Halliburton one because we stand with Liz Cheney to save democracy. Did, did you, uh, wear your mask outside when you were changing your flags? Yeah. For each flag, I have 10 different masks <laughs> that I wear, but, uh, yeah, that's true, man. In clown world, time does fly. Yeah. I, I, I really, I hate to even say this, but like, I can't even keep up with this shit half the time anymore. Like, uh, the last two weeks, I've been really zoned out into fitness stuff, like some political stuff. I, I, yeah, thank you. I, I'm sure you kind of feel the same way. And I think everybody kind of hits a wall eventually where you're just like, okay, I need to like back away because, yeah, you could stay optimistic about most things. But like when you take in all the bad shit that's going on in the world, just constantly 24 seven, you keep scrolling through Twitter and you're scrolling on Facebook and you're just constantly pounded with propaganda and all the shit that's going wrong it really fucking beats on you and for me i can tolerate a lot of shit but eventually i realize like, okay i need to kind of zone out and just think about other stuff um do you ever kind of have those bouts as well where you're kind of like i just need to tune somewhere else for a little bit yeah absolutely man um i mean i don't know if i said when, when i first did your show with reed but i've kind of been really deep into this stuff for about 20 years now really looking beyond the headlines and, and digging deep into the reality of the world of you know, whatever that means. What is the re my reality of what the world is? Just, just knowing at a young age that we're lied to the moment we're born and propaganda is flung at us at uh, warp speed. But yeah, man, uh, trying, trying to step away and unplug from it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're doing, doing some of that because this stuff really does get to you and it can really test you psychologically mentally emotionally spiritually every all the above it can, it can it has a real impact on you and um yeah to to get away from it you know obviously i, I use comedy and uh lately i've been taking some trips it's been really nice you know i, I work my day job and i grind all week and uh when i can i like to take these trips so um, I just went to Texas. I mean, it was oh. political. It was political yeah. related. I went to Texas. I met up with my fellow four horsemen, uh, Reed Coverdale and Ryan Dawson. <laughs> yeah. And we hung out with Ron Paul and uh, saw Ron Paul speak and um, Scott Ritter and Lou Rockwell and uh, probably four or 500 people there. And it was just, that was a charge just to be around um, like-minded people who see a lot of the world the same way I do um, or who, you know, even if we don't agree on everything, definitely big picture wise, uh, don't buy into narratives and uh, fall into the two-party system. But um, yeah, for just just kind of for maintaining sanity, man. Um, I, I, like the like the next guy, I, I enjoy a good like a good movie to unplug for a couple hours. Um, but, but then that too can get ruined because that little voice in the back of your head is like, "This is this is someone's narrative. This is propaganda. This is bullshit." Yeah. <laughs> There's, there's, there's a reason that this movie got a $150 million budget and was created, and I'm watching it on a 40-foot, 50-foot sc screen. 
Um, but I, I got to admit, man, I love the new Top Gun. The Top Gun Maverick was was so entertaining. And, uh, you know, I'm just at the point of meme level with everything that whatever Tom, Cruise, <laughs> whatever Tom Cruise puts out, I have to support just on principle because uh -huh. uh, you're directly and indirectly supporting the Sea Org in Scientology, which is, you know, uh, a tax-free grift and, and criminal enterprise that that we don't see too often of that magnitude. And you, you mm -hmm. have to really tip your hat at that kind of grift and just marvel at it. And Tom Cruise, who's this insane world famous actor who I've been, I've been looking at my whole life. I'm going to be 36 this year. I, I don't ever remember, remember a time without Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. So to see him at almost 60 years old, getting in these, these jets and running around in these aircraft carriers and dredging up uh, a movie that was, was huge the year I was born in 1986. Uh, and they got Val Kilmer to come back, even though half of his head's gone. It was just incredible, dude. It was incredible. It tugged, it tugged at every, every emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I like movies. I like to read. Um, and yeah, I know we've talked a little bit about in Twitter and you've probably seen my, well, you have, you've seen my workout videos. Mm -hmm. um, I hit the gym twice a week with my, one of my best friends and my trainer, Megan. And that's a good time to just throw some tunes on and sweat, get uncomfortable, uh, move your body and and kind of kind of zone everything out for that hour and try to be present in whatever exercise or weightlifting that I'm doing with, with Megan. So those are some of the things that I do. And, uh, you know, I grew up playing hockey. I, I love to get out on the rink. I haven't been out in a while, but um, skating is, is a great release and a good way to kind of phase everything out and be present in, what, in the physical activity mm -hmm. that you're doing. Yeah, I, I agree completely. My fiance and I went up to uh, Lake Erie, which is about two hours away from here. We had a camper and we took our little mini pin with us. And uh, the one thing I, I'm trying to do more often is definitely kind of be there in the moment. And you were kind of alluding to this a little bit earlier, but um, we went to this barbecue restaurant called Underdog Barbecue. And if you look at the podcast I put out today, and this is going to air Wednesday, um, I was wearing the Underdog Barbecue shirt. And there, there's just something really, really cool about, you know, I'm going to be 28 in November. My fiance is 25. We own a camper. We got three dogs. We have our own house. We're flying down to Florida this weekend for a job interview. And it's paid for by the company that's interviewing me. So it's really cool to be, I don't want, I hate to say like established, but to kind of have this much going for me at a younger age. And I really feel like we've hit a good stride. And when we're at that restaurant and uh, my mini pins coming in the room right now, so I'm going to lay down, but um, to, you know, just sit at a restaurant outside, enjoy a drink, enjoy some good food. I don't know. It, like kind of like you were saying with the Ron Paul event, you're around like-minded people and to just be in the presence of other people is something you just cannot overstate. And that was something that was taken away for us for two years, which I know is a yeah. little bit of a black pill, but just when you're around other people, I, I I live for that. You know, I grew up going to live music and I know you've been uh, going to a few concerts yourself, but there's something else about just being around a bunch of other people and not thinking about the political stuff, not thinking about all the danger and doom that lurks around you. There's something just magic about it. Yeah, well, that's exactly it, man. And it's hard when you go so deep into this stuff, it's hard to not look at everything through the lens of politics and policy <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, what the government does and the evils of empire and, and all that when you can just find something and yeah music i've been to a lot of great shows uh lately i love music um my brother's a drummer in a band around here that's in right new yeah new hampshire and um we are making up for the, the lost two years of the flu world order where they shut everything down and kept everybody home um and we're going to a lot of concerts i've been i saw paul mccartney last week actually at fenway park mm -hmm. and it was uh the dude's 80 years old in a few days and it was just amazing, man. You know, that's music from my childhood and my parents grew up on it and they got me into it. And um, it was that was a really nice escape. I went with one of my best friends uh, who I've known since fourth grade. And, you know, one of the cornerstones of our friendship has been the Beatles music, you know, learning it, playing it on guitar, singing it with each other and going to see McCartney and seeing Ringo. Um, so, yeah, that, that's music is always a great escape and a great way to kind of do something different from from the normal uh, political stuff and worrying about all that stuff. Um, and yeah, be, just being out with people. I, when I'm when I'm not podcasting or uh, doing my day job, really, what I just what I get the most joy from is seeing my close friends and seeing my family. And uh, you know, really beyond that, what else do we have? I mean, we have our health, and you know, we have our freedom. But seeing your friends and family 
um, is like top of the list for me, man. That's, that's really what gives me the most joy. And um, whether we're just having dinner or just hanging out, you know, just getting, getting together to hang. Um, it's great. I mean, when I, when I fly out of Logan airport, I have an aunt who lives not too far from uh, Logan and she's always really, really generous. She, she drives me to, right to the airport because, you know, no one likes driving right to the airport or, yeah. you know, paying all that money to park. So she really saves my ass. And it's just, even just that ride to and from the airport and seeing her and hanging out, man, I just cherish those moments. So you got to look for uh, the good and everything. And we have to create our own white pills in clown world, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I find myself, um, my parents split up when I was relatively young, but uh, the, the kind of thing that I do now is um, since my mom kind of raised me, I'll, I'll shoot my dad a text usually at least once a week and just kind of see if I'm not doing anything during the weekend, see if like him and my older brother want to all go out. And I don't know, there's something uh, very special about sitting down for a good dinner, or a good breakfast or something like that with people that you care about. And I do think it goes back to kind of um, our early ancestors where we are very tribal by nature and food isn't meant to be enjoyed, you know, by yourself in like a dark corner. And it should be something you feel guilty about. It should be something once again, you share with other people, it's an experience. So that's why dining out is so much more preferable than sometimes cooking at home is because you're going out there for the experience. And that's something that my fiance and I jo enjoy doing very, very much. We love going out to good restaurants, good steakhouses, and just yeah. enjoying different environments, different areas, and just the experience of trying new food together is something that I think we really enjoy. And we kind of staple our relationship around and, you know, even like same deal with family. It's just really fun to get together with people and do things with people that you care about. Even if that is just going out for a drink, going out for dinner or going to a concert, anything like that. I, I think that's so huge and something that when it comes to politics, I think we really should try to focus on the human to human interaction more. And, um, it's kind of why I like what the Mises Caucus is doing is building communities around things. So it's not just political action. Like, hey, let's host this event. And it doesn't have to be a political thing. Let's host an event and let's just get together and have a good time because that's so much more important than the day-to-day -day political stuff or your day job. It's the, as cheesy as it is, the friends you made along the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how I became friends with Reed. I mean, that's one of the best things from doing uh, working on Tulsi's campaign um, for that year is I met Reed and um, we stayed in touch and obviously, you know, created something really cool with the Four Horsemen and he created Naturalist Capitalist. Um, and yeah, it, it, it is, you know, on top of the, the political goals um, that liberty-minded people have, it, it is a community. And you do meet really cool and interesting like-minded people. Um, and, and even people who you don't agree with on everything, you know, um, I've said before, I'm not really a big gun guy, but, you know, Reed loves his guns and that that's awesome. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, but we, you know, we line up on really big picture stuff and, and that's kind of, kind of where a lot of people in the Liberty crowd gel is that we're just tired of an overreaching government dictating too much of our lives and, uh, you know, taking hard earned tax dollars and flushing it down the drain into a black hole and using it to occupy other lands and kill people and do it all in our name. And in reality, it's just one giant grift for the defense contractors and, you know, more power for the Pentagon and, and the surveillance state and the warfare state. So, um, you know, there's something to be said to even when you're doing stuff that's not political related to politics, you know, just going out for dinner with people just to chat and hear their experiences and their perspectives is a, uh, is a lot of fun. So we were able to do that in Texas. It was cool to see Ryan again, obviously. That was that was uh, our second time hanging out with him in person because we met him for the first time in person uh, down in DC at the counter APAC conference that Roger Waters from Pink Floyd was at at the, <laughs> nat at the National Press Club um, in DC. And we all got to meet Roger Waters. And I you know, got to ask him a couple of questions on camera and listen to him speak and uh, get a picture with him. So that was really cool. So it, it opens a lot of doors when you put yourself out there and you'll meet a lot of really cool people who you might otherwise, you know, not ever think, wow, when would I ever go and hang out with a guy from Pink Floyd, you know, but my political activism um, and the things that I'm passionate, passionate about and care about uh, brought me there. So that's really cool. And uh, yeah, that's awesome. And you, I would, I would totally say you're, you're established. You have a house with your fiance and you guys aren't even 30 yet in this world. I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge victory, man. You guys should be really proud of yourself because 
the way the economy is and, and, and trying to dig anything out for yourself these days is, is becoming increasingly more difficult. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that I think Republicans have really kind of missed. And this is going to get relatively political now. Um, and, and, you know, before we go there, um, one thing I always really admired about you in particular is your non-dogmatic approach to political stuff and even like talking with people. And you've brought it up quite a bit already, but you find stuff that you don't agree with people and you're never dogmatic about it. And that is one thing that I very, very strongly strive to achieve in my personal life, even beyond political stuff. Yeah. But um, I, I think that's such an admirable trait of people who just are not this ridiculously dogmatic character when it comes to things that they believe in because it, it just turns me off and uh, you see the rise of this populist right and some of the and i like a lot of these people so i'm not throwing shade at them but the right-wing hoppy and kind of libertarians and i like a lot of these people they've been on my show and i would have them on again if i saw them in person i'd buy them a shot give them the shirt off my back whatever yeah. but I don't like the dogmatic approach to things where it's my way or the highway, right? You should always be willing to hear, hear people out. Yeah, there's people who may cluster together and you may get similar answers from similar groups of people, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater and people come to their beliefs through certain experiences or from certain things that they learned. And it's kind of our job as people who are educated on political matters to perhaps see what we can do to maybe change their mind, or at least have an interesting conversation to give them another perspective, rather than just say, oh, well, you're a leftist, so I have zero interest in talking to you, or you're a Trump supporter, so I know you're just part of the MAGA cult and you're, you're done for. I, I, so long-winded way to say it, I admire that you're not dogmatic, and I think more people should look at things the way that you and hopefully I look at things. It's just not through this lens of dogmatic my way or the highway. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, um, you know, Reed has said that uh, my brother and I always find the best in people or look for the most admirable qualities and, and the best in uh, others. And whether that's political figures um, or just authors or politicians or whoever it is, whether they're in the public eye or, you know, they're a fellow podcaster or something. Um, because I, that's really like how life is. You can't just live your life saying, I can't deal with this person or work with this person because they believe they have this set of ideals or I believe this and they don't believe that. Yeah. So that, therefore I, I can't even talk to this person. That's, that's, you know, one of the reasons I do Jackman radio, I want to have those conversations with people, um, like we used to have, like when I was growing up, you could be really good friends with someone and then get to know their family and they could have a totally different set of principles and ideals that they live by. But you do have things in common that that are the foundation of your friendship and, and why you choose to spend time with that person. Mm -hmm. And that other stuff just, you don't even, you get to a point where you don't even think about it. You don't, you don't even really worry about it. It doesn't really factor in. So um, I think also too, because you know, especially over the last two years with lockdowns and all that bullshit. But the way things are in 2020, people's lives are largely lived online. So they they don't have that foundation where things like Twitter, you know, they didn't always exist. You know, um, Facebook was really just getting started when I was finishing high school, going into college, like that 2004, 05 mm -hmm. range. So I had plenty of a life lived and in, in socializing without social media without cell phones, without everything being filmed and pictures. And you actually went and experienced things and you didn't bring this uh, device that served as your, you know, watch, phone, texting, email, social media. You didn't have that. So that's like a whole other layer that's been added on to everyone's life. So that then I think puts things at warp speed, uh, you know, for everything. So for your beliefs, for your community, who you socialize with. And it's kind of made people more dug in and kind of uh, more susceptible to groupthink and to a more of an us versus them mentality. And, and, and like, that's the way it is with everything on Twitter. So that's why I love what Dave Chappelle said. He said, Twitter is not real. Twitter is not real life. This isn't real life, you know? So we have to keep that in mind. And, and that's kind of what I keep at, at the forefront of everything that I do that, uh, 
it's easy to just type some shit on a computer and insult others and chime in on things when you're not face to face with somebody and mm -hmm. chances are you never will meet that person. So that's created a really, I think that's, that's created a sickness uh, in our society and our, our environment and how we treat each other and what we think of each other. So yeah, it has, there's many great qualities about it. And, and I, I use Twitter and I use social media and I think it's awesome and valuable, but also um, it's important to step outside of it and remember that there is a human being on the other end of this interaction. And how would you behave that same way if you were sitting across from that person at a bar having a beer with them uh, than you are behind a screen? So that's really how I approach things. And I, I try to see the good in everybody and, and the best that uh, people have to offer. Yeah, I honestly, like I said, I strive to do the same thing because I always do look at it as would I say this to somebody's face? Would I sit down having a drink with somebody? Would I put things this way? Would I attack somebody this way? And honestly, the majority of the time the answer is no. And I've typically the only time I get mean with people, rude or block somebody is when they come at me first. If you come at me first, I'll give you a couple tweets and then all right, you're going to get blocked or I'm going to quit the interaction because yeah. I, I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't want to be that guy online who's a fucking asshole to everybody. That's just not who I am in person. And I hope right. I, that's not who I am online either. It's just because yeah. I, I don't think it makes it for a good experience. We have the greatest technology in the world to talk to whoever, wherever, whenever. Um, I've had people on this podcast from fucking China. Like that is unheard of to people a hundred years ago people who are right. in their 80s now would have never thought that would have been possible and then what do we do with it we take shits on <laughs> random people on the internet like yeah. instead of sharing information and trying to support one another we're out here just going to war every single day on twitter and i am guilty yeah. of it but um like you i try to strive to see the better part of people and try to be kind and if there is a disagreement, then I try to find where I went wrong and maybe how we can move forward and I could be correct going forward or how I need to change the way I look at things. Yeah, definitely. You can't take a lot of stuff personally and we can't really take ourselves that seriously. I mean, you look at how people take themselves so serious, whether they're a media figure or a YouTuber or a podcaster. And it's like, you know, really big picture here. There's a small group click of powerful entities who control our entire planet yeah. and then there's the rest of us and they've employed uh strategies and systems that are in place to keep us doing those very things arguing with each other hating each other divided distracted confused fragmented um and just constantly fighting each other over pretty much meaningless bullshit splitting mm -hmm. hairs about stuff and, and this is why I don't really get into the weeds uh, with, with like the Libertarian Party. You know, I consider myself an independent with, with lib Libertarian leanings, but I'm not a member of the party. I'm not, I don't plan on joining it. I'm supportive of what the Mises Caucus is doing. A lot of my friends are involved with that effort. And uh, I'm happy to see the Libertarian Party getting shaken up because in my view, it's been pretty stagnant the last couple cycles. I mean, I know yeah. when Johnson ran there in 16, uh, he did get a record number of votes, but, but then what? What, ha what came from that? Yeah. You know, we need wall. Like, yeah, we need wall. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the momentum that should have that should have created from 2016, you know, you, you, we should see, you know, a few million people being registered libertarians and being active. So I, I say give the Mises caucus a shot. Let's see what they do. Let's 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 see them mix it up. And, and knowing some of the people involved, I know that those are those are good people. Mm -hmm. And I know that they want the Libertarian Party to really be libertarian and stand out from the two-party cartel that we have in our country and actually offer a real legitimate alternative that in some ways takes some of the best ideas from the GOP and the Democratic Party and carries it and actually truly believes in those ideals. You know, personal freedom and, and smaller government and the right to be left alone and what liberals used to stand for um, being anti-imperialism against war. You know, what the, what the hell happened to that? We don't, we, we just have two war parties in our government now. And I, I think this is a real chance for the libertarians and, and obviously inspired by the Mises caucus to really stand out and, and, and go for it here. And, um, you know, I think the messaging is, has been on point and they're, they're, they're ruffling some feathers, man, but that's politics. You've got to ruffle some feathers. You're going to piss some people off. Um, you, you know, you're going to make some enemies, but if you want to be in the game, that's, that's how the game is played. Yeah. So 
um, I'm certainly supportive of it and I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And my thought on it was you're probably not doing much unless the Southern Poverty Law Center is calling you racist. <laughs> and they just checked that box. So I'm like, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I because I was hanging around a lot of the, uh, well, not necessarily hanging around, but talking to a lot of like the GOP kind of guys, I'm like, eh, maybe the Libertarian Party stuff is kind of doomed. And I had a friend that just got unseated as mayor, unfortunately. And she was an elected Libertarian. And I believe she actually oh, wow. beat an incumbent. Yeah. So um, hmm. she did good, but then they unseated her due to uh, some stuff that i don't want to go into for her sake but um it, it really sucks and that kind of had me looking a little bit pessimistically at the whole deal but um now that i see all this hubbub and these different news organizations talking about the libertarian party it's like oh well this is definitely interesting because they're not pissing off people and like th they're not even running anybody in these midterms like any, any like big name kind of people like you're not seeing tons of news coming out about specific candidates for the Mises caucus and they're already kind of getting ginned up like mm. um i quoted that article from a oh, i can't remember what the fuck the account was but they have almost a million followers and i'm like oh so if you're getting the attention of articles like or you know news places like this then something's going on here so i'm definitely a little bit more optimistic than i was after the whole Reno reset kind of deal. But um, same deal as you. I used to be a little bit more involved, but now I've kind of stepped back just because there's other obligations in my life that require yeah. more attention than politics. Um, but I'm very optimistic for them going forward. And all the people that are in there and doing the hard work, Angela and yes. all them, they're just the greatest of people. Yeah, well, they're, they're taking it uh, very, very seriously and they want to they want to shake things up and, and change things. And I think if we can get somebody who's a good messenger like Dave Smith in front of a national audience, he's he's a good guy to deliver the message of liberty. And there's a lot of people who don't know what a libertarian is, what a libertarian stands for, and that there is an alternative to, as Jesse Ventura says, the two gangs, the Democrits and the Republicans. There, there's actually you know a viable alternative that consistently gets ballot access in all 50 states and could conceivably win the presidency. So... I think there's a lot of people who, who just, you know, don't know about the message yet. And I think they would be very receptive to the message as long as it's delivered in a way that's digestible and, and it clicks with people. So, I you know, all signs point to Dave being the guy who's going to carry that message for the Mises Caucus and run for the Libertarian nomination. And um, I think he'd be great. You know, he's able to get on Joe Rogan. He's able to get on Fox News. He's, he's able to get attention and... I've seen his following grow uh, since I found out who he was a couple of years ago now. Um, you know, I hadn't heard of him. I think I think I probably learned about him in 2020. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've seen his trajectory and he's a, he's a sharp dude. He knows his stuff. He's, he's read all the theory, all the authors. Um, you know, he stays up on current events and policy. And, uh, you know, he makes the point in his special there, Libertas, that, you know, fucking Trump became president. I mean... Jesus, Donald Trump could be president. Why can't Dave Smith be president? Yeah. You know, as someone who's an entertainer and a showman. But, you know, unlike uh, Trump, uh, you know, Dave is actually an educated and learned man on these matters. And <laughs> Trump just went in there. I just I go on feeling. And depending on how many Diet Cokes and Big Macs I had, we'll see what happens, Kyle. We'll set policy. We'll see, we'll see how I feel after I had chocolate cake with two two scoops, two scoops of ice cream. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And, in, 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 you know, having guys like Scott Horton in our corner, mm -hmm. who I've learned so much. Um, I thought I had a pretty good grasp on foreign policy and the crimes of the U.S. empire. And then I got a load of Scott Horton. And holy shit, man. He is he is the ultimate um, source of knowledge about yeah. foreign policy and the crimes of the empire and, and what we've done. And um, so it's just finding a way to package that and market it to your everyday person who's not a freak about politics like we all are, but who might be looking for something different outside the, uh, the normal two-party racket that they got going. Yeah, and I've heard some people say, oh, people heard libertarianism and they've rejected it. But honestly, I, I don't know that I buy that because – like you were saying, I believe it was packaged more so in a way that they would understand, then perhaps they'd be willing to reconsider. 
And Dave may not be that person for everybody, but I guarantee he's going to be that person for a lot of people. Um, Dave wasn't the first libertarian I ever really listened to. I didn't hear him until actually the uh, Spike Cohen and Joe Jorgensen campaign. I heard of him because Spike dropped an episode he did on Joe Rogan. And I was like, oh, well, we'll listen to it because, you know, if Spike likes him, then he's got to yeah. be a good libertarian. So it, it's kind of funny how these things kind of trickle out. And this is kind of what frustrated me with a lot of libertarians who bash Justin Amash. Um, I think they forget just how principled and how many good votes he cast right. and how much of an actual libertarian he was when he was in Congress. And to see people shitting all over him now, it's kind of like you don't realize you're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. And all you are compared to him is kind of a pigeon taking a well, shit, you're, right? You're a troll in the wilderness. Right. Justin Amash was in Congress. This guy showed up and he was a vote. He was a member of Congress. Yeah. And yeah, say what you will. You're absolutely right, man. He, he had a lot of great votes mm -hmm. and he stood on principle uh, with impeachment against the king while he was still in the GOP. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, that took that took a lot of guts. Yeah, so. well, and, and he if you would look at his voting record compared to somebody like Thomas Massey, they'd be identical, literally identical. And people just shit on Amash because he's not this firebrand and because yeah, he may be panders and he may not have the right quote at the right time, but it's like oh. sometimes people have to separate their emotions from the objective outcome of political stuff. And this is what I saw happen a lot with Trump in particular is that nobody was able to objectively assess what he did when he was in office. They just looked at who he made yeah. mad and, yeah. and what the rhetoric was. All right. the emotions. Yeah, yeah. yeah and on rhetoric. both sure. sides. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that was largely, I mean, I tell people, I like, I go, look, man, after the King's four years, the dude really overall maintained the status quo. Yeah. You know, his rhetoric was soaring and it was a disruption and he was a disruptor and I'm going to, I'm going to drain the swamp and we're going to have beautiful health care. We're, we're going to be do... so sick of winning because we won so Kyle, much. Kyle, excuse me. You're going to win so much. You're going to get sick of winning, but not really. Okay. But it was, you know, it was uh, largely hot air and bullshit. And yeah. he got in there, and, and I think the dude had every intention of upending the whole thing. But he got in there, man, and realized the, the machine that that is. That, that is that is an always moving machine, giant, cumbersome bureaucracy that one man simply cannot cannot change. Yeah. You know, and he was, he's, he was up against an entrenched bureaucracy, unelected bureaucracy, you know, that have appointees going back to Reagan that were in there when he was in there. So you've got Reagan, the Reagan administration, H.W. Bush, two terms of Clinton, two terms of W. Bush, two terms of Obama, who formed the government that Trump then was now the head of right. and had to manage and navigate. And he, he didn't know about any of that. So, you know, he put a lot of bad, a lot, a lot of bad people around him um, and, and didn't really shake things up like he, he hoped that he would. Um, but also, you know, I, I think what, what's important too, and, and I have to step back, even I'm guilty of this, uh, putting so much emphasis on elected officials um, and, and members of Congress and presidents and this and that, um, you know, Reed always reminds me of this and he makes this point, really the stuff that affects your, your life is, is your local governance, your state reps, your city council, your state senate your executive council, your governor, those are really the, the uh, you know, positions where we can really have the most impact mm -hmm. in the, the direct policy and machinations that, that have an impact on our life. So, um, you know, you, you, you see li libertarians have had some success in that regard in getting liberty-minded folks in state houses and governors who are friendly um, to some libertarian policies. So, you know, that, that's something to, to celebrate and, and be excited about. But certainly, you know, I, I am a Justin Amash fan. I've always respected him. And, you know, in, in my lifetime, he's the closest thing. Him and Thomas Massey, um, in a lot of ways, were the closest thing to Ron Paul that I've seen. And then what um, made me so excited about Tulsi was she was very close to a lot of that in foreign policy regards. And, you know, matters of foreign policy and war are really like, that's really the main issue when I'm choosing if I'm going to get go all in with a candidate or support a campaign, where are they on war and peace and foreign policy? And then the other things, if I don't agree, you know, we're splitting hairs on some issues. But if uh, you are propelled 
if you were compelled to speak out against the war machine and have votes against it, like Tulsi does, like Massey, like Amash, then, you know, you're someone that I can support and get behind. And I don't care what party you are. That doesn't matter to me. We're, you know, you, you were in a position of power and you did the right thing when you were in the position of power and it wasn't popular, then to me, that signals to me that you're, you're decent. You're a decent yeah. person. Right. And I think that's a way that a lot more people need to look at it is, is this person principled and are they willing to act on principle? Because um, th that's what we really have a lack of is just that people don't have principle when it comes to voting. And I think that's why someone like Tulsi, uh oh, we good? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. My internet sometimes a little fucky. So it's, it's actually been a little bit better than it has normally tonight. Thank God. Good. Um, yeah. Um, but when you see someone like Tulsi Gabbard, when you see someone like Thomas Massey, Ron Paul, sometimes Rand Paul, um, yep. it, it's the passion and the principle that bleeds through that really gets people motivated and really kind of wakes people up to realize that there's more to politics than just left or right. And yeah. that's what's so interesting to me. And really, Rand Paul was one of the, like the first kind of federal figures that really got me interested in politics as a whole. And then obviously I learned about his father, but it was like Larry Sharp, Austin Peterson, Stefan Molyneux, who kind of introduced me into political stuff. And that was through my brother, of course. And then um, later on, like I said, I got into Rand Paul and that's kind of what got me going down the rabbit hole. And it was just seeing Rand Paul be principled and being willing to speak out like watching the uh i don't know if you watch it but i think it was the 13 hour filibuster i mean that shit's impressive and there's something to be said for somebody that's willing to stand there for 13 hours to protect your right to live right to not have a drone strike placed on you yeah. <laughs> you think that'd be like a basic requirement of anybody in uh, the senate or congress right. or any official mm -hmm. elected position but it's not <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's it. Those, those uh, standouts, they actually say real things about the big issues. Mm -hmm. They're not just doing culture war, hair on fire, um, red meat rhetoric and bullshit that yeah. people just, it's like uh, the reality TV aspect of what our politics has descended into, you know, which I'm just sick of. You know, it's, it's entertaining and it's funny, but at the end of the day, I would love to see a hundred Rand Pauls up there yelling about the aid to Ukraine, saying, whoa, 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 time out. We're, we, we, are, we are about to send over $40 billion of the U.S. taxpayers' money yeah. over there. Where, where, the, where the hell is it going? How are we going to keep track of it? Where is it going towards? What's it going to do? Who's going to end up with it? I mean, just Rand even doing that, man, that really, really take the ass of the establishment and the, the war hawks down there in D.C. And I, I was really psyched to see that. And yeah, his drone filibuster was amazing. He did a few years ago. Mm. And you know, that's an issue I'm very passionate about. You know, you, you want to know what creates terrorists? Our drone program creates terrorists. Mm -hmm. if, if you live in some village out in Yemen and a drone strikes your village and kills your whole family in front of you and you're like the only survivor, what do you think that's going to do to that young kid? Right. He's going to have warm and fuzzy feelings about the United States and the American empire and the West is good and the West is just. No. So it's not even going to take much to further radicalize that kid and turn him into a terrorist in 10 years. All right. So, um, you know, it's, it's people who are speaking out against that, that I'm, I'm on their side. Completely. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to float this out here to people, and I, I don't know if I've really articulated it in the podcast, but um, it, it seems like candidates really win on being anti-war over the last like 20 years. Like that seems to be a really big freaking issue for a lot of people. And despite the fact that the news may want you to believe that that's not true, um, look at George Bush, look at Obama, um, look at how popular Ron Paul was, look at Trump. And despite the fact that a majority of the people I just listed off are the complete opposite, and even Biden to a degree, right? He said he was going to end the uh, foreign aid to uh, the Saudis in uh, Yemen. And people love that shit. But then every time they get in, obviously they flip-flop. Um, so would you agree that it seems like presidential politics are almost based a lot on foreign policy and I, i'm not saying just that but it seems like that seems to be a consistent issue with people who get elected is that they're anti-war 
Yeah, well, their posturing and their rhetoric is going to be anti-war. I mean, yeah, W. Yeah. Bush ran in 2000 on a humble, humble foreign policy, <laughs> yeah. which seems so quaint now, you know, Mr. Iraq <laughs> and destroy the Middle East. WMDs. And, oh, God, of course. And yeah. um, in 2008, Obama was able to point to a speech that he gave while he was either a U.S. senator or a state senator. It actually probably was a state senator leading into him becoming a U.S. senator where he spoke against the Iraq war said, I'm against this and I'm going to be anti-war. So he had that. And then, yeah, of course, Ron Paul uh, actually meant it. That guy had a lifetime of voting against mm -hmm. war and appropriating war. Um, and Brandon, um, yeah, I'm sure Brandon had some rhetoric about wanting to rein in what, what's happening to Yemen um, and the United States selling the Saudis weaponry. Um, and not really doing anything about them murdering a journalist like they did an, Amer an American citizen, Khashoggi, in mm -hmm. the uh, Turkish embassy there, or the, the Saudi embassy in Turkey. Um, but yeah, well, now Brandon's going to be going over to Saudi Arabia begging for cheaper oil. And what are the Saudis going to want? They're going to want us to continue to do this with what they're doing to Yemen. So that's mm -hmm. not, you know, that's not going to happen. They're, they're not going to they're not going to do any anything meaningful to stop what we're doing in Yemen. But the rhetoric of being anti-war is nice. It sounds good. Uh, we're a war fatigued society. The American people can't take it anymore. We don't want to send our young um, citizens over to die. For what? For what reason? So we are very war weary. So as far as like a large scale regime change operation like Iraq was overthrowing a leader and then trying to prop up a new government. I don't know that we're going to be doing that again anytime soon. I mean, I hope not. Um, yeah. So really now warfare is fought through cyber. Um, it's fought through special operations, uh, drone warfare, that kind of stuff. So that stuff is easier for the empire to get away with because there's not a lot of eyes on it. Right. And it's not really a sexy issue in the 24-7 news cycle. You know, compared to overthrowing a government and occupying a country, um, there's going to be more coverage and light on that and more people are dying, obviously. So you're going to get some more outrage over it. Whereas these drone strikes that happen, in, you know, maybe a few weeks, a few months after it happens, we hear about it. And maybe it was, it was a miscalculation of who we targeted and we ended up killing, you know, 15 children in a village, but there were suspected militants in the area that just gets kind of glossed over. And the PR machine that's in place to protect empire and, help aid and abet its crimes do they do a pretty bang up job of keeping most people in the dark about that or steering their apathy towards just like a shrug you know mm -hmm. so yeah we like to hear anti-war rhetoric but for the people who actually look at what they're doing we know it's anything but anti-war yeah and that is a sad truth uh yemen had its worst month i believe back in january and then it, it's it's actually amazing to me how blind people were to Trump's foreign policy, because I can't tell you how many pictures you'll see on Facebook and on Twitter. Oh, there were no wars under Trump. Like, you don't understand how many bombs were dropped throughout right. his presidency. In his first year, it was more people killed by drone strikes than Obama mm -hmm. in eight years. And um, I really haven't kept track of uh, Biden's drone strikes. I'm sure it's nowhere near as good. But it's funny now see people feigning that they care when children were killed. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but like, okay, well, where were you for the last two presidents when, I mean, we've been murdering people like in cold freaking blood, yeah. like not even in any slow, I mean, this is horrible stuff. Like you're yeah. saying, we don't understand or well, we understand, but the government as a whole and a lot of our culture doesn't seem to understand just how much this generates hatred. Like when you kill people's families, it's not yeah. radical Islam that's coming over no. here to kill us. It's the fact that we've been torturing and murdering their families for yeah. years. That makes them hate us <laughs> for our freedoms. Right. Yeah. We've been occupying their land. Well, I just, I give the people this simple scenario. I mean, imagine in your state, your home state, the capital of your state, that Saudi Arabia had a giant military base there. How would you feel about it? You know, or Pakistan had a base there or Syria. There was a big Syrian base right in the center of your town. You'd be cool with it, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't mind it at all. You yeah. Know? So it's just kind of a, it's a put yourself in their shoes kind of thing. And, you know, the media and Hollywood and, uh, you know, 
other other things culture has done a great job of just kind of beating into the american psyche that we need to accept that we're just going to do this we're all we're going to have our 800 plus military bases around the world we're going to occupy other people's countries and we're going to call it fighting terrorism or spreading democracy and if you question it you know you're a uh, you're a terrorist sympathizer you're anti-american you're a communist you're a socialist whatever we'll call you whatever we want to yeah. call you it doesn't even matter what we call you but um real meaningful debate and critique of it is is snuffed out and i mean we abby martin for example I, you know abby martin yeah um awesome i've been a fan of hers for for years her and her brother robbie are amazing they have a show they do together called media roots yeah she, just she, real quick um I listened to their show because Pat McFarlane had kind of shipped me over their way. They did two episodes on Ron DeSantis, and I want to talk about this in a little bit, but uh, sure. they were absolutely phenomenal. And I, I listened to some stuff by Abby Martin. I listened to her on um, Reed show, and mm -hmm. then I listened to those couple episodes from Media Roots Radio, and they also had Dave DeCamp on. Yep. Yeah, her and Robbie are uh, awesome. So sorry they to interrupt, but I just want no, to put that out there. Yeah, that's fine. They know their stuff, and, and, that, mm -hmm. and that goes back to finding – the best in people like mm -hmm. so for some liberty-minded people or people on the right the abby martin they'd be like oh she's a socialist or she's this and that on these other issues i don't even, i don't even worry about that bullshit that doesn't matter to me when you see the reporting and the research that she has done into the empire on her show empire files into our foreign policy into the war machine all that other bullshit that that just doesn't mean anything to me um but for so i was talking about you know media and calling out the empire she was able to question anthony blinken our current secretary yeah. of state about the, the murder of that american journalist uh the palestinian american journalist over in israel who was who was just just cold murdered in cold blood and even the main even cnn is acknowledging that it was murder and what it is and blinken is just they're all fumbling you know what well, we have to do an investigation we haven't really gotten to the bottom of it so th that's that's the power that they have man they're able to really even in the face of the gl glaring evidence slapping you in the face, like Will Smith with Chris Rock, just slapping, just slapping you in the face, like a giant mushroom slap from Ron Jeremy. Yeah. Um, it, does, it doesn't matter. The, the empire is able to dispatch their ghouls and their media assets and uh, gloss it over and move on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, I definitely I recommend everybody watch and support Abby and Robbie Martin. Um, they're friends of mine and, you know, I'll always, I'll always be a huge fan of their work and support it and tell everyone to check it out. Yeah, I, uh, I've definitely really enjoyed listening to them, and especially because like culturally and the way that we view social issues, I disagree with them completely. But it's refreshing because I really want to hear the arguments from the other side. I really want to be able to hear what they're saying because – we all have strong feelings about a lot of the culture war stuff. Maybe not everybody, but I know I do. But even like, and this is going to get clipped out, but like when you see the pride parade stuff, I completely disagree with that. I think it's fucking disgusting. But somebody else is going to have an argument and there are some shit where it's like, okay, well, like the, the fucking dude with tits twerking in front of a cop, like no kids should be seeing shit like that. But like, you know, maybe there's an argument for something else in that whole deal that somebody could make, I, I just want to hear it out. I'm not saying I'm going to agree with it, but there's something there because someone's going to have some kind of argument. And it, like I said, I think it's only fair to hear everybody out, not just say, oh, you're a fucking crazy leftist and I don't want to hear anything about you. So um, right. that's one thing that I really like about listening to them. It's just that, like I said, culturally, we're completely different. So Ron DeSantis is very, very popular because he kind of has this populist right-wing streak but I think he represents a big symptom of the problem that we're facing now is that it's got to be tit for tat with everything politically now, where whatever the left does, I have to ban it because I don't like it and my constituents don't like it. Um, what are your thoughts with DeSantis going forward? Because he's not good on foreign policy, and I think a lot of people miss that, and a lot of libertarians miss that. If you look at his congressional record, I mean, it is abysmal. He He's like George Bush, right? Literally, he's like George Neil Bush. <laughs> yeah, I, all the spying, all the war, he voted oh, for yeah. all of it. Um, so what's your thoughts with 2024 and the potential of DeSantis? Because it seems like Trump's fallen out of favor and all the surveys I see, people vote for DeSantis overwhelmingly over Trump, which surprised the fuck out of me. Yeah, well, I think the king is still potent and he's still popular. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against him at this point. But 
I will say DeSantis, uh, his popularity is growing. And, you know, I, I read Politico sometimes, you know, I read everything, but um, even Politico has surveyed early, early voting states, uh, activists, your, your grassroots people who were just live, eat and breathe this shit all the time. Yeah. And like out in Iowa, out in Colorado, um, Utah, um, you know, uh, DeSantis just won the Western Conservative Summit straw poll that wow. uh, Tulsi spoke at. She gave the keynote at, which was a great speech. Um, she wasn't included in the straw poll, but uh, DeSantis won that. He won pretty handily against the king. So uh, in, in here in New Hampshire, um, I haven't heard a lot about DeSantis yet here in New Hampshire. He hasn't been here yet. And obviously there's a reason for that. He's trying to be a little bit coy and he's trying to run for president without running. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's very popular with social conservatives and your MAGA people who like a bomb thrower, who like someone who's brash, who like who likes someone who is like in a position of authority, like a king-like figure. There's a reason I call Trump the king. He behaves like a monarch. <laughs> and DeSantis is a mini king. He's a monarch down in Florida. And he behaves that way. His rhetoric points towards that. And uh, you're absolutely right, man. I mean, he's a tried and true Zionist. I mean, he will do anything yeah. Israel says and wants. And, and, and uh, Media Roots, Robbie Martin did a great um, dismantling or examination of his record uh, of just being best buddies with Israel and they could do no wrong. Mm -hmm. And Palestinians are dirty terrorists and we need to keep subjugating them and taking their land and uh, being against BDS, you know, being against our First Amendment right to protest yeah. and, and boycott and, and speak out against another government uh desantis is no friend to bds certainly no friend of the palestinian cause so anyone who really cares about foreign policy um and is not through a partisan lens you know like i am just look at it critically i mean you should you wouldn't be a fan of ron desantis i mean his voting record is is, is horrible in those regards um but on one side of me is he's a lot of fun i mean the, the, nihil the nihilistic side of me that looks at comedy <laughs> It looks at pol politicians and politics just as a big clown show that it is with, with clowns and, and uh, actors and, and reality TV people is, is he's hilarious. He pisses off the left so much. He he triggers them, man, like just as much as Trump does. And that has currency, man. That has currency on the right. It has currency in the MAGA aligned media and the, the media on the right and Fox News. I mean, DeSantis is like a like an a, a exalted one on Fox News. Yeah. You know, they're just eating that guy's shit, man, like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I think he's going to be a potent force if he decides to run. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, his ability to fundraise yet nationally. I know he's raised a lot of money there in Florida. I don't know what his national donor network looks like. I mean, the king is, is still has that, man. He, he The guy can go in anywhere where the right is popular and, and does well uh, electorally and, and get thousands of people to come see him. And outside of Trump, you know, DeSantis has been tested that way. So I don't know who can draw those kind of crowds. Pence is definitely running. Uh, he was in my state a couple of weeks ago. And um, funny story, I haven't spoken publicly about this, but I actually bought a VIP photo op ticket to meet Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. And the committee, the Republicans committee who was putting it on, you know, do their dil dil diligence into who's dropping this kind of money to, to meet Pence and do a photo op. And like a couple of days before the event, I got an email and said, yeah, we appreciate you buying a ticket and want to meet the vice president, but this is for Republicans only. So we are disinviting you and refunding your money. Whoa. So I got disinvited and they refunded my money. And uh, I was bummed, man, because I, want, I wanted to go meet Mike Pence. I mean, that's part of my shtick here in New Hampshire. Um, I make it a goal to meet everybody who's running, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. Like you look back through my social media, I have, picture, I have pictures with John McCain. You know, I'm not proud of it, Kyle, but there are <laughs> pictures out there of me with John McCain and his, his daughter, Megan. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's pictures of me with Jeb Bush. I mean, I've met them all, man. I like to go meet him and mix it up. And uh, that's part of what I want to do. I wanted to meet Mike Pence and just get a picture with him and talk to him and bullshit. Um, but uh, that's how tribal things are getting, man. Like they obviously figured out who I was and that I worked for Tulsi Gabbard for a year. Um, and I said, yeah, man, I'm not a Republican. I'm an independent who has voted Republican, who has voted Democrat, who has voted Libertarian. Um, but uh, he's like, yeah, we're canceling your ticket. And I said, boy, you, you Republicans, man, you love to yell about cancel culture and the right, the left always canceling people. Well, you just canceled me, you asshole. You know, thank and, uh, you. Crickets. I got crickets. I got no response back from him. I will say my money was refunded. So New Hampshire GOP, I appreciate that. 
Um, but uh, shame on you for shutting me out from that event. But I'll, I'll find a way to meet Mike Pence. Uh, the, believe me, Carl, I'm going to meet Mike and I'm going to talk to him about January 6th. I'm going to talk to him about China. I'm going to talk to him about a lot of things. Okay. And, and maybe my people were right when they said that we should hang the guy. Maybe we were. Maybe they were. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, I, I watched a debate t- between him and Kamala, and I swear to God, those like two styrofoam boards just oh, beating awful. each other off. Um, it's it, awful. Yeah. But, uh, what, bottom line on this, this sorry, in a roundabout yeah. way to get back to the no, Santos, okay, yeah. I think if he runs, man, he's formidable. Um, he's got a bit, he's high profile, and I think he would give the king a run for his money. But man, if, if this thing is on and it's Pence, DeSantis, the king, um, Pompeo, Nikki Haley, Cotton. It's going to be a fucking bloodbath, dude. And we are going to see yeah. the king be nastier and meaner and even more brash than we've ever seen him before. And I'm betting, I'm betting on him winning the nomination. I I'm, I'm pretty torn because DeSantis, a lot of people really, really like him, but he's not quite as like on his toes and sharp as Trump is. But when he has like a zinger, I mean, people, oh, yeah. I mean, people eat that eat shit up, up. and he undoubtedly loves the Floridian people. And, and I mean, he makes no bones about that. And that's very, very powerful when you start expanding yeah. that. And I, I, I would almost wager it would be DeSantis in 2024. Beat, I know. You yeah. beat the Sultan, you think? Uh, me and Reed have <laughs> shot the shit about this a little bit, but yeah, I, I kind of lean on that because the vaccine stuff with Trump, he's been yeah. really bad on that. Oh, yeah. I mean, hate Trump that Trump shot and booed at his own events by it. He's like, look, I don't say you have to take it. You should. <laughs> look, I took it. Okay, I'm fine. I turned out fine. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with me. But um, yeah, no, that, that's an area. And yeah, th- that'll that'll come up. I mean, you know, DeSantis, anything good that happens in Florida, he can claim victory for it. Yep. And anything bad, oh, it's just the left and the liberals and the commies. So. That's what he's going to do. Yeah, well, I, I feel like... If DeSantis wanted to play rough ball with Trump, and I don't think he would want to, because Trump or uh, DeSantis doesn't seem like that kind of guy that would go after his own, you know, because he he I'm sure he looks at Trump favorably, but uh, I don't think that he'd be willing to go off on Trump. But I feel like in the situation that he was put there, I feel like DeSantis has a lot of ammo, and if he wants to, he could fucking lay down the line with him. He- he also could get in line and say, look, the king can only do four more years. So yeah. maybe I'm his running mate. Maybe I'm in his cabinet and something that's low stakes, but high visibility, like an ambassadorship or a lower yeah. level secretary in the cabinet. And I'll take my ambassador shot. to Israel. <laughs> yeah, he, he already is. <laughs> yeah, he'd, be, he'd be fine with that. Um, but yeah, yeah, he could do that and just wait his turn till 28. And then the king is out of the picture and it's, totally wide open so yeah trump was here in pennsylvania actually it was probably like 15 minutes away from where i work and uh he brought out the owner of johnson and johnson and that was like the that was the most awkward thing i ever saw he's bringing him up on stage and you could like hear a pin drop i'm like yeah I don't think that's that's part of the reason why I think it's it's a little shaky because it doesn't seem like his fingers quite on the pulse anymore. I mean, yeah. like I said, people just hate the vaccine stuff, and he's right. all about it. Well, that you know, that's the thing, and, and that's that's the disconnect that a lot of yeah. people just won't they won't cross that bridge. Like, right, the rhetoric is not matching the action. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I love Trump, man. I love get a kick out of him. He's, he's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I, I love him. I owe a lot of my my career, my comedy career and success I've had. Yeah. I owe to Donald Trump, so I wouldn't turn my back on him in that sense. But the the action and, and what he does is it doesn't oftentimes does not line up with what he's saying. So mm-hmm. case in point with you know the vaccine and we're gonna have freedom, it's gonna be great freedom, but you should get your vaccine. Here's the CEO of the company, he's a great guy. I know him, I trust him, he's amazing. No one's gotten injured from it, so take his word for it. You know what I mean? And people yeah. don't like that. You're right. People don't like that. So. Don't don't discredit the vaccine because it's the greatest success we've ever had. It's, Please take credit un- for it. It's unbelievable. It's it's so incredible. Even a guy like Keith Richards, who loves putting needles in his arm, he couldn't <laughs> wait to put that needle in his arm. Believe me. The, but, they told me it couldn't be done. <laughs> right. But that's those are those are some of the fault lines, and those are the things that are going to come up in a 24 primary. And as a political nerd, I'm I'm here for it, dude. I'm so excited for the chaos, for the triggering. 
for the entertainment, for the fireworks. I mean, that 2016 primary where it was Trump versus oh, all the establishment, one of the, one of the greatest things I've ever seen. So if we can even recapture a little bit of that magic and madness. I'll be here for it because on the Democratic side, if it's going to be Brandon, it's just it's going to be miserable. Yeah. And uh, we need we need some fireworks. And here in New Hampshire, man, if you can make it up here, we've got a front row seat to all of it with the primary. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I uh, <laughs> I remember Rand Paul, we were talking about Rand a little bit earlier, but uh, the, the Trump answer, I forget, he was saying something about banning the internet and Trump literally says, so they can kill us, but we can't kill them. <laughs> like, like, this parts, parts of it we could just ban, okay? What, they could just kill us and get their heads chopped off and we can't do anything about it? <laughs> And Rand, Rand is just like resting Rand face. Yeah. And then that one night when Rand wasn't doing well, so he's like, boy, Rand, you're having a tough time tonight. I gave you a lot of money. Pretty soon you're going to be off the stage. Yeah. He's, just, it, he's, every, he's everything to us. Yeah. And, and that's, that's definitely one thing that uh, I, I think I probably don't say enough because as much as I do bash Trump, there, there's probably nobody fucking funnier in politics. Just his – his humor, his punchiness is just some of the funniest shit ever because he's just on a dime right there and able to drop bombs whenever. His his comebacks are everything, and, and he really is a lot of fun. And, uh, I mean, a high point of the whole Trump deal was meeting with Rocket Man and not going down the path of bombing North Korea and having a war with North Korea. Yeah. And that, that was historic meeting with him, and, and I always defended Trump on that, and I always will. I think that's one of the best things about his presidency. And it was just so outrageous because Dennis Rodman was there and it was, it was just, just everything. It was incredible. Little Rock, I'll go over there and bring him a hamburger, okay? I brought him Elton John's rocket, man. I signed it and I said, we don't need to bomb this little guy, okay? We can have beautiful peace, yeah. beautiful peace. So it was, it was incredible. But I'm, I'm excited for, you know, the upcoming uh, election. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably a good place to kind of wrap up there. Um, I got three questions I ask just about every single guest, if I remember. Um, so we'll start with the first one. Uh, Eric, what does liberty look like to you? Uh, liberty is, you know, being left alone and living your life in a way that as long as it doesn't harm others or infringe on others and, and you're living your true self and you're happy and you're honest every day, that's liberty, man. Nice. Nice. Beautiful. What does health look like to you? Health is uh, balance, man. You got to, <laughs> I haven't had alcohol in, today is day 164. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, I love my beer and um, I'm, I'm work, it's, it's always a work in progress, but I'm working on balancing that, mm -hmm. balancing, being able to still enjoy alcohol and beer, but not being over the line where it's going to creep in and, and be, be a detriment to my life. Um, so I challenge myself to do six months alcohol free July 1st will be six months. And, uh, when I get there, I'll see how I feel. I might want to have a few beers. I might want to keep going. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, health is balance and waking up feeling good every day. Nice. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I used to drink a lot more than I do right now. Usually I'm down to like maybe at most two drinks a week, but, uh, nice. you know, it's usually just, it's. When I talk about diet and stuff like that, I always try to explain to people, I did carnivore for two years. And mm -hmm. even then I still opted for the highest quality of life where sometimes the highest quality of my life at that time was eating cheesecake with my fiance, have an ice mm -hmm. cream on oh, a nice day or man. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Oh yeah. So, you know, sometimes the highest quality of life is sitting down and if you're at a nice steakhouse, you get an old fashioned, and enjoy your steak or yeah. whatever. And you know, you don't sit there and worry about the calories that was that was in it or freak out about anything. You're just there to enjoy the moment. And um, when I talk to people about health, I, I really try to focus in on that. Like, you can't build your whole life around this ridiculously strict approach. And really, that goes beyond just health stuff, too. But yeah, you, you got to figure out what's the highest quality of your life in the moment. And you obviously can't pursue that 100% of the time. But yeah. once again, in a special occasion or something like that, it's perfectly okay to enjoy and you're not a bad person for that. Of course not. Yeah, you got to do what feels good, man. Mm -hmm. You know, but you got to go to take care of yourself and find and find balance. And yeah. I think that's one of the beauties of living is, is always just trying to find greater balance in everything yeah. we do. Right, right. And I'm completely guilty of being off balance quite a oh, bit fuck, sometimes. Fuck yeah, yeah. We, we're human <laughs> beings. We're human, dude. We're humans. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, where can everybody find you? 
uh, yeah, so I'm on uh, Jackman Radios on YouTube. Please subscribe to us on there. Um, I'm on Instagram at Senator Jackman's my personal account, and then I have one on there for Jackman Radio. That's Jackman Radio, and you can stream our podcast on Podbean, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, and I'm on Twitter at Jackman Radio. Almost at four thousand followers. So been been working on building that up. Never had my Twitter account nuked. So knock on wood there. That's that's been quite a journey. And then um, if people like what we, we do, um, we ask you become a patron at patreon.com slash Jackman Radio, five bucks, 10 bucks a month, whatever you can throw down to help us continue to grow our channel um, and book interesting guests, uh, upgrade our gear, hire professional videographers for interviews. We have a great library of interviews that we did during the 2020 election where we had, he's one of my best friends from college. He's a uh, wedding videographer but he's a very talented film editor and videographer and we did interviews with Andrew Yang with Tulsi with Marion Williamson with Mark Sanford with Bill Weld um, that were professionally done that, that I would I would argue there's some of the best quality with both content and production value independent presidential interviews um, on the whole internet and of course I got one on there from 2016 with Jesse Ventura so <laughs> dig through my channel I got some great interviews and um, I have a lot of fun, and I don't just talk politics. I talk pop culture, music, movies, comedy, you know, um, art, books, all kinds of different stuff. So I try to have a diverse um, line of, of subjects and stuff. And you're doing awesome with your channel, man. And I love, I love looking at your stuff. And you know, Carly's healthy. He's he's young. He's fit. He's strong. He's handsome. He's doing a great job. Doing a great job. So yeah, give me a follow on there. Of course. Yeah. So make sure everybody, uh, you go check his stuff out. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. I always say I'm very terrible at uh, telling people to do that, but I'm starting to get a little bit better at it. Uh, Eric, this was a lot of fun, man. We'll definitely do it again. I enjoyed having you on. And, uh, you know, if uh, you don't got anything else, we'll close her out. Yeah, absolutely, Kyle. Thanks for the invite, man. And we will get you on Jackman Radio soon. And uh, good luck with that job interview. Let me know how that goes, man. And I, I, I don't see how they don't say, Kyle, you're hired. <laughs> and they don't say Ro Rosie you're fired yeah I would love to sue Rosie just take some money from I her think, fat ass pockets probably sue Rosie I think it'd be fun I'd like to take some money out of those fat ass pockets I like to fail I like to see bad people fail but Rosie fails I'm happy about it <laughs> one of my favorite videos ever <laughs> oh dude when I if I need a lift I just I put that on dude and I'm good I'm right yeah. as rain I, I completely get it, dude. All right. <laughs> Here's everything. All right, Kyle. Thanks for having me on, brother. Keep up the great work, man. Of course. Thank you. You too, man. Thanks.